The key to creativity in construction and workplace injury cases are finding the responsible parties, asking the right questions at depositions, and overcoming summary judgment motions which are guaranteed in every construction case for the reasons we'll go through in a couple minutes. And that creativity starts with knowing the law in the forum in which your case is venued. In New Jersey, uh, David Morales uh, was 35 years old, um, and on the job, a, a, a nail gun was being passed from him from a wooden truss above down to him below. In the process of that, that nail gun being passed from, from one worker to the other, a nail was inadvertently shot and went into the side of his chest, which resulted in a major open procedure from his chest to his belly because that nail went not only in the side of his chest, but it ended up injuring his diaphragm. As a result, he can't go back to do the work that he does, not only because of the scar tissue, but the shortness of breath that he suffers as a result of this injury. But when we got the product manual, in the manual when we read it, it said to disconnect the air hose, the power to the nail gun, when passing it from one worker to the other. And then when we looked at the OSHA regulations, there was also an OSHA regulation specifically on point that said the same thing. Next slide, please. And when we finally started getting documents in the case, including the documents of the general contractor, the general contractor is Sunt Construction. Sunt Construction had its list of, I think I counted 34, 35 different safety points that Sunt Construction was retaining or accepting control over, telling the workers how to work safely. Not a single point on that list had anything to do with disconnecting the air hose from the nail gun when passing it along the work site. Next slide, please. Even after the accident occurred, there, there was a special meeting and finally a special written policy about the use of nail guns on the work site even after this accident occurred, and even after four other nail gun accidents on the same site, they still did not include um, that point that they were supposed to disconnect the air hose while they were working and passing the tool from one worker to the next. In uh, every case, as I said, you'll be faced with uh, uh, summary judgment motions. One of them will be, well, we're the statutory employer. That's what it's called in Pennsylvania. Next slide. In New Jersey, it's called the special employer. And what they say is, even though we're not the direct employer of the employee, the guy who was hurt or the girl who was hurt, we're still entitled to immunity because of certain elements that are recognized under the law. Again, a focus of the law is on control of the work site. And, and it's important, again, to know this law and to know those different elements because it shapes the types of questions that are asked at the time of the depositions. In the Clayton case, uh, a federal district court case in New Jersey, it involved Mr. Clayton, a 42-year-old man with three kids who uh, was going up in a bucket truck and suffered an electrocution and, and unfortunately died uh, leaving those three kids without any financial or economic support. Before he went up to do the work in the high voltage lines, those lines were supposed to be de-energized. The prime contractor under the contract documents had again responsibility for safety. So it's important again to look at those contract documents. In section 26, safety, there's actually language that the prime contractor, this company, North Star, was supposed to have a safety manager. In reading the fine language or the fine uh, print on the contract under basic requirements, in addition to OSHA, there was another manual that was referred to, the Army Corps of Engineers Safety Manual and that the prime contractor was supposed to comply with. So we went and got the, uh, the, the uh, Army Corps of Engineer Manual and in, uh, in the second to last paragraph there, the, the, that safety manual said the prime contractor, again, was responsible for having on site a site safety and health manager. If they had done that, they would have known that OSHA required that those lines obviously be de-energized before the workers went up to work on those lines. North Star, of course, said, well, we're the employer, we're the special employer, 
we're not uh, responsible in this case, we're entitled to immunity. I took the deposition of the president of the company, had to go out to California to do so because I knew they would be filing a motion for summary judgment on that basis. Ms. Chang, based on your earlier testimony, uh, is it fair to say that electrical work is not part of North Star Technologies regular business? It's not. Okay. Um, does North Star Technology have the ability or the knowledge to control work at a job site like Fort Hamilton pole replacement project that involves electrical work? To control and direct? No, it, we're yes, not qualified. As you can see, if they're required to act, actually exercise some direction and control over the work being done at that site, by that testimony alone, they didn't. They not only didn't, they didn't know how to. So how can they argue that they had control over these workers? The last uh, point of law I want to make is, is on collateral estoppel. North Star Technology, the prime contractor, was initially cited by OSHA as an employer. And in the second sentence, the lawyer for North Star, writing to OSHA, a federal government agency, said North Star is not the employer in this case. And not only that, further admits, does not have control over the job site at Fort Hamilton. They're, they're very hard pressed now to come in and say, we're an employer and we're entitled to immunity.